All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Zoe Rogers Speaker Series event for the month of March. It is an absolute pleasure to have all of you here. Um, if some of you I've met, and you have been on many of our calls. Others, it might be your first call. So uh, my name is Mike D. Candido. I am uh, thrilled that I am the chairman of the board of Common Bonds and really excited to have a wonderful speaker series event uh, on a really, really relevant topic in our society, society today, and that being voting policy. So I, I would like to introduce our panelists um, for today, and we're, we're really, really honored to have them and the expertise, and I know we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful conversation. So first, uh, I'd like to introduce Delaware State Senator Medina Wilson Anton. Uh, Medina uh, represents the 26th district of Delaware, where she grew up, uh, and she currently lives with her husband, mother, and sisters. She's an alumna of the University of Delaware and holds a bachelor's degree in international relations and Asian studies. She has formally studied Arabic, Chinese, French, and Spanish. While at the University of Delaware, Medina, uh, Medina, excuse me, was actively involved in several campus organizations where she held leadership positions, including the Muslim Student Association, Students for Justice in Palestine, and a sorority, Latinas Promoviendo Comunidad Lambda Pi Chai Sorority. I practiced that. <laughs> so uh, she worked for two years as a legislative fellow in the state legislature, an additional year as a legislative aide for the 26th and 27th districts in Delaware. And she did this prior to being elected as state representative for the 26th district in 2021. She is also the first practicing Muslim ever to be elected to the Delaware State Legislature. As a state representative, uh, she is fighting for social, economic, and racial dust justice for all Delawareans. So Medina, it is a pleasure to have you and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, next, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Debbie Harrington. Dr. Harrington is a passionate mother, experienced leader, community and education advocate, and a very proud veteran. Dr. Harrington's doctorate is in education with an emphasis in innovation and organizational leadership from Wilmington University. She is a retired U.S. Army Colonel with 25 years of executive leadership in multinational strategic transportation and logistics planning, systems integration, and organizational structure. Uh, after military retirement, she became the senior administrator. Uh, became a senior administrator where she led major construction product projects, managed multiple ministry and community development initiatives, and provided oversight and management to pro progress her church financially. She later became the deputy director for the Division for the Visually Impaired, where she challenged the division to reform education and employment services through research and development. Dr. Harrington is currently the second vice chair for Delaware's Democratic Party and has been a political candidate for state representative who believes in people first. She is very, very active in the Delaware community and serves in several organizations to help build community capacity, including Delaware State University's Board of Trustees, Delaware's Board of Examiners of Psychologists, Alpha Alpha Tau Omega of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Ready to Run Delaware, Middletown Police Advisory Board, and Special Education Strategic Planning Advisory Council. Dr. Harrington, welcome. All right, thank you, Mike. Thank you, thank you for having me. And I would, I, uh, for, for both uh, Representative Medina, Representative Wilson Anton Medina, and for Dr. Harrington, if you want to read even more about their uh, very, very impressive bios. You can go onto our Common Bond site because I only, I only shared the high-level pieces. Um, I am very, very pleased to announce our facilitators tonight. For those of you who are uh, attendees to our Common Bonds uh, uh, sessions often, you will recognize her, her lovely face. It is Fennell Norton. Uh, Fennell Norton is a Common Bonds board member and a, a major contributor to our success. Uh, a little bit background on Fennell. She was born in Exmoor, which is a small rural town on the eastern shore of Virginia. She earned a bachelor's degree in human ecology with a concentration in marketing from, Ham from Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, after she finished college, she went to work in a retail store entering their management associate program 
And then in 1986, Fennell went on to work for Bank of America and had a usually successful almost 30 year career at Bank of America rising into a number of executive level positions. Uh, Fennell retired in 2015 from Bank of America, spent the year with Accenture Consulting Company. And then in uh, 2018, she set up two sole proprietorships, Common Sense Consulting and Rich Girl, Poor Girl. Fennell recently ran for Virginia House of Representatives for House of Delegates for District 100 and is very active in the community and community of affairs, both on the Eastern Shore of Virginia and throughout the state of Virginia. So as you can see, we have a uh, very, very impressive uh, group here to talk about this very, very important topic. And uh, with all that, Fennell, I'm gonna hand it over to you to start the discussion. So thank you all for joining us. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mike, uh, for having me uh, have the privilege to do this. And Representative, Representative Medina and Dr. Harrington, thank you both. It's Women's History Month. So this is so exciting that I get to have a conversation with the both of you. And so I think it would be only fitting uh, to start with you, uh, Representative M Medina. And, uh, should I call you just Medina? You can so call me Medina. But it's funny, it's funny you ask because we do have this like running joke in Delaware politics now where people call me Rep Medina and they <laughs> by their last names because I have a hyphenated last name and that trips people up sometimes. So they, they're always Rep Medina, Rep Medina. <laughs> Rep Medina, that's where we're going tonight. <laughs> so why don't we start? I mean, it's been very impressive to look at your bio, but let's just talk a little bit about how you got here. I think folks would be very interested to hear that. Sure. So uh, let's see, it's been about a year and a half now that I've been in office. And I'll say my introduction um, to state politics happened in undergrad. So as a student at the University of Delaware, I was studying international relations, like Mike mentioned, and I was looking for an internship that paid, just being real. And yeah. the internships in politics at the time, and, and it's, we're still working on it, didn't pay. So I saw this really exciting opportunity where I could go and work down in our state's capital, which is Dover, and work as a staffer to support committees, um, which I just left one of them. Um, and that was my introduction to how state bills pass. Um, but in that experience, I also learned how state policy impacts everyday life. And the reason I ended up running was because while I was down here, I saw folks come in from the community advocating for changes on education equity, actually, and funding around that. And as I heard them make their arguments, I realized that the issue that they were pointing out and the solutions that they were offering would have helped me as a student in middle school. Um, and so hearing those conversations, seeing that there still was a lack of political will to make those things happen is why I decided I was actually going to run. Um, but if it wasn't for that internship where I came down here, I'm actually in Dover right now. Um, if it wasn't for that internship where I got to see the committee process up close, talk to legislators, see what it what it's um, what the job is like dealing with constituents, um, ha having them come to you with ideas, and then figuring out a way to make it actually become a policy, probably never would have been elected. <laughs> Well, you see, that's pretty exciting. So those who weren't here earlier should know that we just saw you run from committee because you introduced the bill. We'll probably talk about that later. And guys, just so you know, you can put questions in the chat uh, that you have along the way, and we'll be sure to include them to get them answered because we don't want you to walk away from here tonight not getting all of your questions answered. So Dr. Harrington, that brings us to you. So let's talk a little bit, tell the group a little bit about how you got to where, you're, where you are today. Oh, thank you for now. Uh, and, and again, thank you uh, for having me here. This is a excited, uh, exciting stuff here to be talking about uh, voting rights tonight. Um, but I, I came here, I got here. Well, first of all, uh, I was in the military and retired from the military and ended up in Delaware. And I um, retired early because I my daughter, I have a, my youngest daughter um, was born blind and I wanted to get her in a school that uh, was better for her. So I ended up in Delaware and, uh, well, first Pennsylvania and then Delaware. Uh, and I was, uh, to tell you the truth, I was, I went to legislative hall one day because I was trying to get uh, the legislators to change some legislation that would affect 
her education and and of course not just her but children who are who are uh, blind or visually impaired and uh and i and i i got down there and uh liked it but uh i liked the process but i was having a difficult time getting it done um and i and i started thinking well i could i could do this myself and uh, the more I thought about that, the more I got involved in, in, in legislation and in politics. And, and then it just went from, from education for students who are visually impaired to education for people who are well, with disabilities and on and on and on. And, and you know, social justice, social advocacy, just, it just went on gun, gun safety. Uh, everything. And before you know it, before I knew it, I was um, running for office and, and I had not had that experience um, before. So, um, so close to, or maybe perhaps I hadn't had the need either uh, to be that close uh, to legislators and to legislation. And, um, and so uh, I, I felt that I could make a difference. And so I got involved and ended up running for office and now, and, and then moved from there to now being the vice chair, second vice chair of the state party, Democratic Party. So that's how I ended up here. It started, just happened to start. It was, it was by happenstance that I, I started this and, and then it just evolved into something bigger and, uh, and now I am uh, even more dedicated and, and doing more work than, than I started out. Well, I think that's really awesome. And so I think what I want folks to also get a sense for is, is what it feels like to be a woman in these roles and particularly what it feels like to be a black woman uh, in these roles. And so uh, Rep. Medina, can you just talk a little bit about that? So what are the obstacles that you faced and tell us how you overcome those? That's a great question. And unfortunately, today is you're getting a different answer than I would have given you up until about 445. Um, so I had a bill in committee today, this afternoon, and it was pretty controversial. And, and it's actually on the topic that I mentioned to you all earlier about education and equity. And it's something that drives me. It drove me to run. And it's something I'm willing to lose my election over. That's how much it, it matters to me. And um, this afternoon, we had a lot of people from the community come out in opposition to it. And towards the end, um, when the bill was, was successfully released from the committee, there were some outbursts from folks that were in the room, cursing, all, all types of stuff. I'm actually a little bit shaken from it still. Um, and you know, so I'm thinking about that as a woman, right? Mm -hmm. where my safety is really important to me, and I felt you know, maybe I should, maybe I should stay around people after the meeting. And I, and I actually called our Capitol Police in to get me to my office safely. Um, but it's, it's stuff like that when you're running for office and you're knocking on doors. Um, I didn't go alone for a reason. And I was advised by lots of people not to do that, to bring someone with me, um, not to go when it's dark. People don't like to answer the door when it's dark anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But just to, just to, you know, keep your safety in, in mind. Um, and as a black woman, it's it's heightened even from from just for being a woman, right? So um, there's definitely racism, and I think the way that people talk to you at times is based in stereotypes that they have about you, is based in um, bigotry, which I think we saw today, unfortunately. Um, but at, on the positive side of it, I think um, when I was running, people were really itching for something new, some a, a new voice. Yeah. A different perspective. I heard that. That was probably the theme of of door knocking, right? Everybody was um, saying that, and I was actually pleasantly surprised by that because um, I am pretty young. I was elected at the age of twenty six, and I'm only twenty eight and twenty eight and a half <laughs> right now. Um, so I'm the youngest member of the General Assembly in Delaware, and I was worried that folks might see my age and think that I wasn't experienced enough or that I, I didn't have something valuable to bring to the table. And actually, when I talked to people in my community, I heard the opposite. I heard, I'm tired of hearing what older white men want. It's time for a new voice at the table. It's time for someone who's bringing something different. 
And I heard that from people who didn't look like me, people who were much older than me. And so that was really um, exciting. And it kind of drives me to remember it's important that we have diverse voices at the table and that not just diverse people want that. Um, and that kind of is what's keeping me going, even though sometimes <laughs> it's hard to see it because people that might come out are not representative of the community. Um, I, I do still recognize that. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a different answer than I've ever given before because of today. So I, I've never said it before. <laughs> so I hope it came out in a way that was understandable. Um, but I, I'm just a little bit shaken still from the incident this afternoon. Yeah, I, I think you would be, and I would just say, I continue to be brave because I think that sometimes if you don't walk around in someone else's skin, you don't really have any idea what it feels like. And then in particular, when you introduce a bill that others find mm -hmm. distasteful or, or whatever, uh, then, then they definitely don't know what it feels like. And I think this is sort of perfect in terms of what's happening with you know, our first black Supreme Court justice to be is that she is seeing questions that are very disrespectful. But yeah. um, I would just say to you to continue to be brave. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and, and if I could say something about Medina, who is one of my favorite people uh, in Delaware. Um, so, you know, Medina came, Medina is young. And, uh, and that's a good thing, but she came during the time that after uh, Obama, uh, after President Obama, after George Floyd, after, you know, so, so many things have happened and we have had, um, we've now had the experience of seeing people that, that are, are examples for us that give, uh, that, that allow younger people to, 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 uh, to touch things or to do things that they had not done before, because now they see that. And we didn't have, I, I didn't, compare to Medina, I didn't have that example. So, you know, I came from the, I was in the military in a predominantly male, obviously, predominantly uh, white, obviously. And um, so, you know, it, it was different for me. So so things that, that she can try now, we, we couldn't, I, I didn't dare think that I could try uh, before now. So I think people have a, a, a different perspective and, and by, by people like Medina and people like uh, you and I for now, by us being in the positions that we are in, we have to remember that we are exact, being a very good example for people, for younger people to come up and know for certain that they can hold positions that we previously had not been able to hold. So that's, so our, our um, uh, Supreme Court uh, justice uh, candidate, uh, that of course you as you said the the confirmation hearing is you know gets disrespectful and all but th those are the things we, we we we're still having to go through in order to make way for someone else and I thought um, that uh, Senator Booker said something really extraordinary last night when he talked about he was telling uh, her that that the telling the judge that there, you, your family is here with you, but there's some, there are some others here with you too, your ancestors. And so, so that's what we are building here. We are going to be those that come ahead of so many, so my youngest daughter, uh, you know, Medina's children down the road. Uh, so, and on and on and on. And we have to remember that, that that door is open now, but it was opened by someone. And so now we can walk through that door, but we must make way for someone else to 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 come through it so when I get really tired sometimes you know running up and down the road doing this and doing advocating for this advocate I have to remember that I am somebody's example and that somebody is that if life will be changed for that somebody and guess what that somebody will change life for somebody else so we just have to as you say for now stay brave and, uh, and we, we're going to keep on trucking. That, that, that is exactly right. And Medina, Rep. Medina, you're probably setting the example for a lot of others because you said, this is so important that I am willing to lose my seat for this. And, and if we had more people who actually stood up for things that they believed and for things that were right, 
and didn't stay there for the sake or not say anything for the sake of losing a seat, then we'd probably be much better off. And so, uh, Dr. Harrington, I did want to talk to you about the role that you have, because I think it's pretty significant. So for the state Democratic Party, you're actually the vice chair, which yes. means in terms of understanding what the party should be doing, the messaging, all of those things, you have a responsibility for that. So can you talk a little bit about what that means for Delaware? And then we're going to expand and talk about the work that you guys do, how it really impacts everybody on this line across the country. Yeah, so uh, I am um, one of uh, two vice chairs. I, I'm the second vice chair. The first vice chair is a male. And I'll tell you that in Delaware, th I am the first, um, well, for, let me go back. Our chair is a woman also. And that was, this is our first time having a woman chair. Uh, I am the first African American, I'm the first woman vice chair, and of course, the first African. African-American woman vice chair. And then uh, this, the, the other vice chair is also a, an African-American um, male. And so I, I tell you, that, go, that speaks to what I was saying previously about how we, um, you know, things are changing and times are changing and we're, going, we're walking into doors that we otherwise would not have walked into. And so we have to remember that we are an example. So somebody now will easily come behind me and say, oh, well, okay, I can, I can do that. And so, and behind Medina and say, well, I can become a, a state representative. Um, but this is an opportunity for me to, uh, to help, uh, to first of all, offer a perspective that um, had not been understood. So I bring with me the perspective of uh, several, as a matter of fact, as an African-American, uh, first and foremost, and uh, as an African-American woman, and uh, then of course, as a mother and a, a veteran. So I, you know, I bring a perspective that, that our uh, communities have not experienced at this leadership level in Delaware because I, I am the first African-American woman to hold a seat. Um, so, it help, so, so I'm in the position now to help shape how we connect with the community and, and who and what part of the community that we connect with. So, so, so too often, you know, I, I believe too often our communities are left out and in our in the messaging, we don't hear uh, how how you're going to connect with, for instance, the African American community. And I think by my being there, by uh, my my uh, peer uh, Kobe Owens, uh, African American male being there, that we will see to it that you are not only connecting with the voters that you are used to connecting with, but that you are connecting with the, a, the, commu with the communities that are oftentimes left out. So, and when we are recruiting for candidates, it's not gonna be just recruiting uh, for, you know, just uh, white males or uh, and, and leaving out a uh, community that will make great candidates. You know, the, the recruiting for the representative Medina Anton Wilson and uh, recruiting for others and, rec and, and bringing in those kinds of candidates that are not that are not just focused on their areas, but are connected are uh, in tune with a community that too often again gets left out. So this is my opportunity to help shape the platform for the Democratic Party, for us to really do what the Democratic Party say they will do. They say we are for all people. We are going to organize, we're going to recruit candidates um, that is inclusive, that looks at the areas that uh, we are, um, we tend to leave out that we that have been discriminatory areas for years and years and years, and we're going to try to clear up all that. I want the party to be true to that message, and by me being there and ensuring that they are uh, uh, being true to that message is good for our community, and so and it's good for the party because it helps them to to uh, to speak 
truth and to 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 do what they say they are going to do. So I'm there. I'm glad to be there. Sometimes, you know, I say, oh, okay, I, you know, I I have a home to run. I got a, I got children. I or young, not I don't have little children, but I have responsibilities. Um, but this is uh, a huge responsibility as well that I'm committed to, um, and and it's much needed. And it's our way of making sure that our communities are connected. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrington. Representative Medina, so here's the thing. You told us you're 28 and a half. And so we were thoroughly impressed. We were th so, so we have a question and it comes from Wanda Thornton. And it's what I was going to ask us too, is how do we get more people engaged like you? How do we get more young people interested in this process? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And it's it's not an easy answer, right? It's not one thing. I don't think, um, I think part of it is having legislators, regardless of their age, um, and people like Debbie, who are focused on issues that impact young people, right? So like, I know a lot of young people who aren't into politics that don't vote, don't pay attention, right? But they know that Joe Biden hasn't forgiven their student loans, and they remind me of it often. And they're like, you told us we should vote for him and he still hasn't forgiven my student loans, right? So student loans, that's one issue that impacts a lot of younger people. Mm -hmm. And they're very, um, I think they would probably be more likely to be engaged in the political process if they felt that that was at stake. And that's just one example. It, the environment was a big one. When I would door knock, young people, when I would ask them, what's important to you? Climate change, what are we doing about the climate? How are we gonna make sure that we have a protected environment for the next generation, not just for me, but for my younger siblings or for my future children? Um, so I think that's a big part of it. Um, I also think that it's important that we go to the community and that's what that's honestly how I got elected. I won by 43 votes in a three-way primary. It was really, really, really close. It was a nail biter. We were up pretty late. I think we may have been the last um, election decided that night. And it almost went to like a, a recall. So it was pretty close. And the reason why we won was because we got people in, involved in the campaign and voting who normally don't. And a lot of times campaigns choose not to do that. They choose not to focus on people who don't vote regularly because they assume, and data shows, that if you haven't voted, you're likely not to vote. And if you have voted, you're likely to continue to. We gotta change that. And it takes resources and it takes you know, commitment to doing it but it's important that we talk to people who maybe haven't been engaged in the past because we don't know what it is that will drive them to get engaged. And we don't know why they're not engaged. Sometimes people aren't engaged in politics because they don't have the time. So it's important for campaigns like the one I had for the party, uh, like the one that Debbie's helping to run statewide here that we go to the community and we ask, what do you, what's important to you? What keeps you up at night? What's making life difficult for you? And how, and how can we fix that? Sometimes people will tell you the problem and they'll also give you a solution or an idea on, towards a solution. Sometimes they don't know what the solution is. And that's, that's part of my job as a legislator is to hear problems and think of solutions, to reach out to people who can give me solutions. Um, but I think sometimes we discount people just because they don't use their voice when I think all it takes for a lot of people is um, to be told that their voice matters and that you know, my campaign is a great example of it. We won by 43 votes. People say voting doesn't matter and my vote doesn't count. Those 43 people, not even 43, 43 divided by two plus one, right? Like that's really, that's really what could have made the difference. <laughs> um, so every last one of those people's vote mattered and the other thousand plus on my side and on the other two sides, um, they matter too. But sometimes we just need a more concrete example of that. So I'd say, the way I look at it, at least, is I put the onus on us as legislators, as politicians, as people who work in politics, as community members that care about these issues, to work on our arguments and to go into the community and actually have these conversations and not discount people just because they haven't been involved in the past. I think that is an awesome answer of response. And I'm, we're gonna roll right into another question from John Ridgway, which is a great question. And so Dr. Harrington, you'd probably have a perspective on this as well. And I'll tell you guys, uh, I, I work on messaging for Virginia Grassroots, so I'll have an opinion too. But one of the, the issues is local and national issues. How do you prioritize the two and how do you bring it together? 
So Dr. Harrington, at the level that you are, that would be a really big part of your role. So talk to us about that. Yeah, no, I don't, it is not a lot of difference in um, the, the national and um, the local, you know, maybe the local, uh, you know, some people are concerned about their, their, their property taxes or, but the big issues, and I think uh, the representative Medina would agree, the big issues are the same, no matter what state you're in. That's what, what I've learned. And so big issues like, you know, knocking on doors um, this past election season, and probably even coming into um, this, this new election season, talked about, it really was about wealth gap. So it was a lot about minimum wage. That was one of our top priorities is the uh, raising the minimum wage. Uh, is healthcare, is particularly uh, as a result of COVID-19, um, you know, we see quite a few, we've seen quite a few disparities um, in particularly in, in health. And, and I, I think probably, and you, you probably would say the same, uh, that, that in Virginia, in Delaware, whichever state you're in, um, it's people are still concerned about health care and health disparities and making sure that you have equal access to not, not just access to health care, but access to quality health care, uh, wealth gap. And um, people, lots of people lost jobs. So uh, lot, it, it was, you know, we, we just finished doing the, um, Medina helped me with this. It was the family paid, Paid family leave. Family, yeah. Paid family leave was huge in, in in Delaware, but I bet you you could go to Virginia and find that paid family leave is just as big in in uh, in Virginia as it was in Delaware. So I think that the local there are perhaps are a few local um, issues that people are concerned about um, that don't align. Maybe it doesn't align with because you don't pay the same property taxes as we pay. But 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 overall, I think the national and the local issues align um, very nicely in, in terms of what people are in need of. Right now, I think mental health is huge. So at our, in, in our um, legislature, they are dealing with uh, mental health issues. They are creating legislation that will tackle the issues that people face with mental health. Well, you go to New Jersey or Pennsylvania, they're probably doing the same things because we discovered that in uh, as a result of COVID-19. Uh, we discovered food insecurity. People who do that kids uh, you know, they go to school, so many kids go to school and depend upon um, getting that breakfast or in that lunch. And, um, and, and that's not just here in, uh, in, in Middletown, Delaware, where I live, but I'm sure it's all across, I, I know that it's all across Delaware, and I'm sure that it extends uh, far across uh, all across the country. So, so, so the issues that people are facing uh, right now are aligned, I think, locally and nationally. We are suffering from the same needs, uh, no matter where, no matter where we live. That that's what I believe. And voting, I know we're going to talk about it, so I, I won't. But voting is a huge issue. Is voting is a huge issue for us locally? Is for us locally? I just we just went through a a Middletown. Uh, election here for uh, for councilmen, um, and 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 we think about you know that we had concerns coming out of that election. Well, you know, is and it's that way nationally. It's going to be that way. We we put it into place voter protection committees to ensure that people uh, can vote safely and soundly, and um, and and it doesn't make any difference where you are, whether it's local or national, statewide or national. Those are those are huge concerns. Okay, Doctor, uh, so Representative Medina, would you would you quickly like to respond to that? And then there's a couple of questions I want to talk about as it relates to voting as well. Yes, thanks for for offering that because I I did want to piggyback a little bit on that. Um, so what we did when we were running was we took what was nationally the focus and we tried to think of, okay, how can we translate that into local? Um, so minimum 
is a it was an easy one. I'm trying to think of what um so like the Green New Deal, right? That was that was really on the news when we were running. Mm -hmm. um, Black Lives Matter, we talked about what can we do at the local level to protect Black lives, to make sure that we have transparency around our police, our law enforcement, things like that. So taking what's on the national stage and what we know is, is for most people who, who follow politics just a little bit, that's where their focus is. So how do we kind of redirect that to, and that's why you should care about this candidate. That's why you should care about this bill. Um, there was another point I wanted to make on that, but now it's escaping me. Um, I just, I, I guess what I'll say is I think it's, again, it's on us to make that connection. And, oh, that's what I wanted to share was what I said earlier about how I didn't know about state politics, right? So a lot of people don't recognize and know or aren't taught even um, just how much of an impact on those national issues can be had at the local level. Mm -hmm. So I try to always remember that and remind myself of that, that if you asked me six or seven years ago, you know, you, you care about the environment. What should, what's your state legislator doing about it? I would have been a deer in the headlights. So I try to translate from my wonky politics brain to the average Delawarean. Why should you care about elections um, and, and do it that way? So I hope that's. Yeah, and you know, Penel, I just want to just say, <laughs> people, will come, people will come out, the people come out to vote. They come out to vote for the national issues before they come out to vote for their local issues. Yes. You know? So so national issues, really, we have to focus on that because that helps us drive that vote out is that we say, hey, this is going to affect you here. This is going to affect your, your how much uh, your, your income. This is going to affect the food you have. This is going to affect your health care. This is going to affect the number of uh, people who are uh, in, in, in the criminal justice system. So, so it's those national issues that help drive people to come out, even in the local election. Yeah, so so I'm going to agree with that, and I'm going to say that what what I find to be really important is that when we talk about uh, national issues, that we do have to make them make sense on the local level. People will mm -hmm. always say that it's kitchen table issues that drive mm -hmm. elections. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you, yes, it's kitchen table issues, but it's also how do you connect that to the national issues so that people understand both of them have to work together. It starts at the local level and then it works its way up. So a question that's here, and then I'm gonna talk about this uh, using Virginia as an example, and then we're gonna talk about voting rights. And I'm gonna give a little history lesson and we're gonna talk about it. So, this, so um, Lori wants to know that uh, in terms of politics, politicians seem to talk a lot about uh, black and brown people. And then once they get in office, then there's not a strong fight for it. So I wanna talk about what happened in Virginia. Uh, in Virginia in 2019, uh, this, uh, our General Assembly uh, was blue. And there were lots of really great things on and work that they did. Uh, one was voting rights. We mm -hmm. went from being number 40 in voting rights to being number 12 in terms of making it easy to vote. Uh, marijuana was on the agenda. We made marijuana legal in Virginia. It's not, a, it was a certain amount, but you couldn't get pulled over and go to jail as people had been having, and it was happening more to people of color. And so dude, we're gonna change the law so it's an even playing field. Uh, minimum wage, minimum wage went from $7.25 up to $10 with a plan to get to $15. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, paid family leave also uh, on, the, uh, on the agenda. These things got passed. Uh, what happened in 2021, uh, the Republicans uh, took over and it was really sad because the very first thing that happened is bills started to come through to stop the minimum wage to, to $11. Uh, bills started to come through to make it harder for people to vote. Uh, so all of the work that had been done, a lot of work was being done now to, uh, to block it. But thankfully, we still had the Senate. So there's been lots of work, calls to action, grassroots organizations uh, to make that work so that we can still hold on to all the great work that's being done. So I think this brings us to what do people, what can people do? What, what can you do as a volunteer? What can you do as grassroots? But before that, I want to take a minute to talk about voting rights. And you guys wanted to mm -hmm. talk about gerrymandering. So we'll talk about that and make sure folks understand. But I wanna give us a piece of history so that we can set the stage for this. Let's set the table. Mm -hmm. In 1965, the Voting Rights uh, Act was done. 
And that made it easy for people to vote. You couldn't discriminate. You couldn't make it difficult for people to vote, especially people of color, because that's where the impacts were. Uh, in 2013, uh, there was Shelby versus Holder. Is actually the Supreme Court changed that. Now, I can tell you in 2013, I probably didn't know two Ps about Shelby v. Holder, but I can tell you I know about it now. Because what happened is in that 1965 act, what it actually said was, if you are a Southern state and you discriminate uh, and you have discriminated in the past against minorities, people of color, poor people, you can't change laws unless you take it through to the, to the justice system in, in DC or wherever they are. And they will let you know whether or not this change can take place. That's really simplifying it, but that's what happened. So these Southern states just couldn't make changes that would make it harder for people to vote. They had to have pre-clearance before they could do that. Well, after Shelby Beholder, that all went away. And when that all went away, let me just tell you, all hell broke loose because there has been law after law. Legislators in 49 states drafted more than 440 restrictive voting bills in the last year. When you think about that. So why don't we talk a little bit about voting rights yeah. and what, what makes it so difficult and why the freedom to vote bill is so important. So who'd like to start? So I, I'm sure that I'm gonna I'm gonna yield to Medina because I'm sure she wants to talk about the we we're working on um, I think House Bill 75 now and uh, so those are some initiatives. So let me just yield to her first and then I'll 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 talk. Oh, so that. respectful. <laughs> um, I, I would have done. I would have said you should go first. Um, so I'll, be, I'll be brief. I think you have more to say on this. Um, so in Delaware, I will start by saying. We're, we're doing pretty well on this. We haven't seen so much of an onslaught of bills to tear away the rights that we have. Um, what we have seen, unfortunately, is pushback to expanding access to the right to vote. Mm -hmm. um, right now in Delaware, you don't need an ID. We don't, we're not one of those states. Um, there are often times where people will, will mistakenly think that and be turned away. And so we have folks that volunteer their time to protect people's rights at the polls on election day. Um, but one of the bills that, that um, Dr. Harrington mentioned, HB 75, was a bill to expand absentee voting. So when the, when the pandemic hit, the governor um, and the legislature did like a temporary bill, a temporary bill that allowed all Delawareans to vote by mail. Um, that is now gone, that right? And so we're back to what we had before, which was you can vote absentee, but you have to have certain excuses. And mm -hmm. been trying to do with HB 75 is to remove those excuses and just make it no ex excuse absentee, effectively vote by mail for all. And fortunately, Republicans yeah. refuse to, to support that. Um, a lot of the same rhetoric that you hear nationally, we're hearing locally, right? Where, it, well, there's gonna be fraud, there's gonna be people, be people, be people who are voting uh, multiple times and things like that. So that's been a struggle to try to get through. Um, and that's something that I wanted to mention to an earlier question in the chat too, because some of these things are partisan, but some of the time there's just silliness. I was talking to a legislator who's a Republican who doesn't support that bill, but who does support a different bill that expands voting access for people that live in municipalities who have to register to vote for the municipality, but also to vote for the state. And he's like, that's silly. They already showed their ID. Why are we making them do it twice? That's a barrier. And because he's a Republican and he didn't support that other bill, Democrats aren't supporting his. It's just silly. And so he comes to a Democrat and says, hey, can you take my bill and run it as your own? I don't need the credit. I just want to help people. And I just thought, that's just ridiculous. We, sh we shouldn't be petty about it, right? We should be, even if we disagree with them on one thing, we should try to get the wins where we can to help people. And so he actually asked me if I could do something like that on the environment because it's not going anywhere. Well, that voting bill that was originally his, a Republican's bill that was switched to being sponsored by a Democrat, yesterday it passed on a party line vote. Republicans voted against it. <laughs> That's how, I don't know if I explained that in a way that makes any sense because it doesn't make any sense, but it just shows how partisan some of our, our circles have become and how it really just, it, it's at the detriment of the voter, of the person who wants to have their voice heard. So I just thought I'd share that because it's just so silly. But yeah. I, I, I think that's a great point. <laughs> that became 
honestly, everybody has to do the right thing. And it can't be one side or the other. It's just common sense. And one of the things that I think is important is to let some sunshine in and let people see how ridiculous some things are. And then when that happens, then hopefully some of the stupidity will just stop. Uh, Dr. Harrington, you wanted to say something. Yeah, no, I, I was just gonna say, uh, I, I think for us is uh, expanding uh, the voting rights is very important and looking for ways to do that. I think a huge way uh, to do that, and, and I haven't seen this bill, I know um, previously some years ago, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, uh, one of the representatives, I think, tried to introduce this bill, but um, it didn't it, it didn't go anywhere. And that was to to make and I'm not certain Medina can can comment on this uh, if she if she needs to. But um, that's to make Election Day a um, and a paid holiday. Uh, you know, because, uh, you know, just think about it. A lot of times the the people that, um, particularly people of color, um, but we're holding the jobs, but the people who are holding the jobs that they can't afford to take off, and then they are not able to, to access voting. So I think it would be extraordinary if we could, we could move that uh, and I'm, I'm if the representative Medina, if I you feel can it. See my face, I'm winking. Yes, I'm I winking do. At you I feel say, you through, hey. the, through the screen. And I just want to, I'll let you know, I'm not sure if we have folks from Delaware on, but one way that this is being addressed is by actually, he, he's not right next to me, he's through the wall in the next office. Representative Eric Morrison, who was also in 2020, is working on something similar to that. So it's not a paid holiday, but it is mandating that um, all employers give their employees, I think it's two hours mm -hmm. to go and do that on election day. So it's it's not as good as it could yeah. be, uh, yeah. but but then the need is definitely recognized. And I know he's been working on that a lot. Yeah. Not sure a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, and I think it would be very helpful, especially to people who are, uh, you know, are, are right at the minimum, the minimum wage, you know, and that, that we can allow them to, um, because we all have a right to vote. Right. And, and it seems to me that the, the significance here is that we allow, we make sure that people have, can access voting and we make sure things are done so that they can access voting, which is for instance, for those who uh, are working, uh, have to work and cannot afford to get, take off that we allow for that. And so that, that's, that's very much needed. And I'll tell you another thing, same day registration. I don't know what, um, you know, other states are, are doing about that, um, but that's something that we need to do. Same, same day registration. Um, so, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was just going to say we, we should approach the same, that we should try a legislation for same day registration uh, to limit people. People get right up to the day. Some people get right to the day and then you say, well, okay, you can't vote because you didn't register, you know, two months ago. And, uh, and it, it just shouldn't be. I think same day registration yeah. should be an automatic. So, so let and me just, go ahead, go ahead. Can I just real quick on that to our earlier conversation about engaging people. I, I used to work at the polls. I like as a student and then as somebody who wasn't in school anymore and nothing is as defeating to someone who took the time out to vote for the first time to get there and be turned away. And a lot of times they won't come back. So when we talk about how do we engage people, I think, I think that's a great way of doing it because I've seen with my own eyes people that are just, you know, they're disappointed and they drove all the way down or, you know, they dropped the kid off at home and, and it's just really disappointing. And that could be the moment where that person says, you know what, I'm not even going to try next time. And I just, I really hate to see that happen. Yeah. So, so I want to make sure that, that everybody walks away from this call uh, informed. And so I, I want to, I think this point is really important. As we talk about every kind of issue that's important, uh, whether it's the environment, whether it is uh, getting your student loans paid off, I think it's important that folks really go back and take a look at how things work. And so we're in a 50-50 Senate and a 50-50 Senate is, is, is not all that helpful. And mm -hmm. so if we're not getting some of the things that we want, that means we have to engage and we have to right. vote for enough legislators to be able to do that. And we do need more in the Senate. We do need our House of Representatives, no matter where you are in this country, yes. we need to maintain the House. 
because we aren't getting voting rights done because we don't have enough votes to get it done. It right. shouldn't be relying on just one or two people. It, it has to be uh, the, the, the 60 votes that we need. So right. I wanted to just say, none of this matters, whether it's local or state, whatever issue you're trying to do, it doesn't matter if you don't vote. And so right. I wanted to walk away today understanding that there are things in our way. And the Freedom to Vote Act is what's uh, needed in order for these things to happen. So all of those bills that I talked to you guys about uh, earlier and with those states and Virginia is now one of them. Here are just a few of the kinds of things it does. And then Dr. Harrington, back to the things that you said we needed to do. So uh, what legislators have put in place to make it harder for people to vote, limiting the time for mail-in ballots, shortening the time for early voting, uh, making harsher ID requirements, mm -hmm. limiting the number of mail uh, ballot boxes, um, making it harder, uh, uh, making it easier if they purge the voter file. So therefore you go, like you said, Rep. Medina, and you're going to vote and then you can't because your name is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the Freedom to Vote uh, Act will make all of those things consistent across the country. And it does make election a federal holiday, which is fantastic. It extends mm. the voting hours. So I would encourage anybody, if you just go and you just Google Freedom to Vote Act, you'll see all of the things that this does because we all have a responsibility to talk to our legislators, uh, state and federal, to let them know what kinds of things are important to us. So that's where I wanna end this. Rep Medina and Dr. Harrington, tell us, give us some call to actions that we should walk away from this phone call thinking about and that we can do. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the chair. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, I would say, first of all, go vote and not just vote in the national election or during the time that the, the president is running for office, but even particularly, like you said, in the off years when we're trying to hold on to the House nationally, uh, and we're trying to uh, and and hold on to the Senate. I mean, we really go vote because if when you don't vote, then we stand the chance of not getting the things done that are very that are important to our lives, to our lives right now. But it's important to our children's lives as they grow as they grow. And 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 the Freedom to Vote Act is one example of that. So we, there's a lot we the build back better. You, you guys know the struggle over that, trying to get that done, the infrastructure bill, that, and I'm talking national now, you know the struggle over that. Well, that's a matter of not having the enough, not holding enough of those seats. And the, to get enough of those seats, it takes us to vote. And, the, uh, and my last thing is get involved and, and really, you sit back years and years, I was not involved and something inspired me. I had to have something to inspire me to, to get involved. Well, tonight I'm hoping that I, ins I am going to say that we have said something tonight that inspires you to get involved. I just want you to know that it's easy to do. It really is easy to do. And wherein maybe you thought that I can't do anything. No, yes, you can. We need you out there. We need you engaged. We need you connected, helping us to connect with the community, to move them to always, always vote. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. Rep. Medina? Well, first I'll say ditto. I agree with everything that Dr. Harrington said. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go a step further and say not to just get involved, but to possibly run for office, if that's something you're interested in, or like yeah. uh, Dr. Harrington said about it, it being inspired by someone, maybe there's someone that's inspired you that doesn't see themselves as someone who should run for office. Tell them that they should. And we're in um, Women's History Month, right? Um, I don't remember the exact statistic, but it takes for a woman to decide to run on average three or four times being told you should do it to actually start to think and see herself in that role. So be that one person who adds to the three or four times for someone who maybe doesn't see themselves as a legislator, but would be an amazing one. Um, I think one other thing I just wanna point out on the voting um, front is that those lines that we talk about, this, the gerrymandering and all of that, that all happens locally. And those mm -hmm. old lines impact national um, issues. So if you become a state legislator, you get to vote on those maps in a lot of ways. So 
I would say not uh, to get involved and part of getting involved is to become informed of what's happening locally in your community. Check out the local papers, the local blogs and see people that represent you if they're doing what you think they should be doing. And if they're not, see about changing who's in office. <laughs> that is exactly right. So very quickly, I will say this. Yeah. Uh, everyone says that Democrats will lose uh, in 2022. And I say that we won't lose because it's very easy. There is enough of us and all we have to do is vote. Our yeah. democracy flourishes when everyone's voice is heard. And so we've been waiting for all of you who are on this line tonight. Thank you so much, Rep. Medina, Dr. Harrington and April, I am turning it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. First, let me just apologize for not having my video on. I um, Something is going on with my neck and I have a heating pad, so I didn't want to uh, be viewed with a heating pad. So I do apologize for not being live. But let me just say thank you so much, Representative Medina and Dr. Debbie Harrington. And of course you, Fennell, for a wonderful, wonderful, much needed conversation, uh, real-time conversation about uh, our uh, politics and um, law, uh, politics and what's going on actually even right now as we speak. Um, I heard, um, I believe it was Dr. Debbie Harrington say that she hopes that what you guys have said tonight was inspiring enough for us to, to uh, hear the call to action. And I, for one, have definitely been inspired. And so I wanna thank you, um, all three of you for being examples, wonderful examples and, and for being inspirational uh, to me and, and so many other people. So thank you so much. And also tonight I heard, um, uh, Cory Booker say uh, to uh, Ms. Jackson, Ms. Brown Jackson, who's who's being confirmed today that um, that she was a trailblazer. And I want to say that you guys are a trailblazer, and that you know you are responsible for the door being open. And he went on to say that, yes, the door is open, but the door remains heavy to push. And I, I just want to thank you that you guys are making it a little easier to push the doors open for generations to come. And so thank you so much for this conversation. It is definitely um, inspiring and much needed. Uh, thank you for being uh, diverse voices at the table. I really do appreciate it personally, and I'm sure that our uh, co Common Bonds uh, community and, um, appreciates the work that you continue to do. So thank you so much. I do appreciate it. And I want to say also thank you, Common Bonds, for your continued participation and support. Uh, you make it possible for us to continue our work in educating on what drives racism against African-Americans. Thank you so much for what you contribute. And we do thank you and look forward to seeing you next month. Next month is an equally important topic that we're discussing. Uh, it is policing and law enforcement. Uh, oh. So uh, definitely look uh, for communications to that effect. Uh, that conversation will be held Tuesday April 26th at 6 p.m. And we'll have another dynamic panel to discuss, again, policing and law enforcement. So we do look forward to seeing you. We thank you again for uh, coming tonight and uh, hope that uh, from uh, Mike and I that you enjoy your evening and uh, we'll see you next, next month. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.